Hello and good morning to everyone everywhere. Welcome to the Sunday 11 a.m. assembly at the Orange Vale Church of Christ. My name is Chuck Polis and in addition to our assembly that's happening now online, we also meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. here in our church building. And so next Sunday, if you happen to be in the neighborhood, we hope you'll join us. Later on today at 6, we have a Zoom Adult Bible class that's studying the book of Revelation. And tonight we are going to finish up Revelation chapter 17 and get into chapter 18. This Wednesday at 7, our Zoom Adult Bible class is engaged in a character study of David in a series we're calling The Exploits of David. We also have a Zoom children's class that meets Tuesdays at 5.30 p.m. And that class is for children between the ages of 8 and 12. Plus, we also offer an online Bible study correspondence course. And you can sign up for that by visiting our website at ovchurch.org and clicking on the banner for World Bible School. We also have a class that meets Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. here in our building in our fellowship hall, and that class is currently studying the life of Christ. And of course, all are welcome to join us. We also want to make sure that you're aware that after every 9 a.m. Sunday assembly here at our building, we have a snack social. And of course, everyone's invited to stay in the snack and to socialize after the morning assembly. And if you want more information on any of those classes, even some tech support on how to get connected with Zoom, please feel free to message us through Facebook or YouTube, or you can email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org so that we can get you the Zoom ID and the class materials that you need and get you connected. As always, if you have any announcements for next week's bulletin or prayer requests, please let us know. Let's pray. Most Holy Father, dear God, thank you for blessing us with another Lord's Day. And Father, as we come before you in worship today, might our worship be pleasing in your sight, Father. Father, as we think about how you have created us wonderfully and with a purpose, Father, we pray that we will use our bodies to glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Romans. I'll be reading Romans chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13 from the International Version. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on seeing. For my heart 
to find to bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship your holy Just a
It's at this time that we would like to invite you to share in the Lord's Supper with us wherever you may be. You know, every Lord's Day when we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper, we reflect upon Jesus' sacrifice on the cross so that we could have salvation, so that we could have forgiveness of our sins and spend eternity with him. And so as we share this piece of unleavened bread together, it reminds us of the time when Jesus shared it with his disciples that very first time. It reminds us again when Jesus broke the bread with the disciples on the on the road to Emmaus and with the disciples, oh, uh, after the miraculous catch after his resurrection, you know, and having breakfast on the shore. It reminds us that as we partake the bread, Christ is with us we're a part of each other so we're here for each other so we're all together let's remember Jesus now again as we partake of the bread Father God we want to thank you so much for being our God and for giving us Jesus and Father as we think about your son and all that he's done for us Father help us to do so in a manner that's pleasing to you in Christ's name I believe I've shared this with you before, but there were, there were times when I've taken the Lord's Supper and I've partaken of the cup and um, kind of missed and dribbled down into my shirt. The first time that happened, I was quite upset because I thought, how am I ever going to get grape juice out of my shirt, out of my white shirt? Fortunately, there are some pretty good stain removers out there. But then I started thinking about the significance of the blood and how Christ's blood, although it could stain white clothing, it is that blood that removes our sin stains and makes us white as snow, pure and holy before God. And so as we partake of this fruit of the vine today, help us to remember that this symbolizes Christ's blood that cleanses us from our sins and removes our sin stains. Let's pray. Most Holy Father, dear God, again, we want to thank you for this cup and all that it represents. Father, help us reflect upon Christ's sacrifice and, Father, the blood that, that cleanses us of our sins. In Jesus' name. And that concludes the Lord's Supper, and it's at this time, out of a matter of convenience, that we take up the offering. And again, we want to thank everyone who has either dropped by or brought by or, or mailed in or digitally sent their offering to help support the work of the Lord here in Orangevale and the missions that we help to support around the world. Over in Mark chapter 12 and verses 41 through 44, we read about this time where Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. We're told many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. The point being, the gift that you give isn't measured by the amount that you give in comparison to others. The gift that you give, God knows that you gave from what you've been given. It's all out of your own personal love for the Lord. And so we do ask that if you can help to support the ministry here in Orangevale and again the missions that we help support around the world, that, that you do so as a cheerful giver. 
Let's pray. Father God, we do so want to thank you for blessing us with so many good things. And Father, we pray that as we think about our offering today, that we give with a cheerful heart for the glory of your kingdom. In Christ we pray. Amen. As always, you're welcome to bring your offering by the next time you visit us here in Orangevale. Or if you'd like, you can use whatever services your bank has to offer, like bill pay. <coughs> Or you can simply uh, mail a check to us and address it to Orangevale Church of Christ, 5915 Main Avenue, Orangevale, California, 95662. It's at this time that we would like to encourage you to sing along with the song for the message today. sit for the president of the school and I'll have to admit that when I usually talk about that I kind of make it sound a whole lot better than what it was but the reality of the situation is that the house was completely empty except for the things that I brought which was kind of like a my books uh, and a blanket and a pillow that's, that's kind of it you know Anyway, he just needed someone to watch over the house until it sold, and I needed a place to stay. So it, it all worked out nicely. But just imagine that while I was there, that I decided to maybe redecorate the place. You know, maybe paint it purple with, with yellow spots, or, uh, or maybe black with white stripes like a zebra. Um, I don't know, maybe remove a wall or two, just to kind of open up the space, you know. Uh, or maybe, worse yet, I just decide to have a big old crazy party and invite so many people over the place just gets trashed, you know. Well, if I did any of that stuff, then when the president of the college came back, he would be pretty upset. But then I might defend myself by saying something like, well, you know, I didn't think you'd mind since I live here. Or how about, uh, I just wanted to fix it up, you know, to make it feel like my home. The thing is, it's not my house, right? You know, it's the president of the school's house. I was just being allowed to use it. And when it comes to you and me as Christians, well, we tend to make the same mistake when we act like our bodies belong to us. But the truth of the matter is, is that everything and everyone ultimately 
belong to God. Think about it, going all the way back to before Genesis, God, we discover, is the creator, right? And rightful owner of everyone and everything. And that's even more true for those of us who have entered into a covenant relationship with God through our baptism into Christ. And that means that it's important for us to know and understand that our lives and our bodies belong to God. The Apostle Paul explains this truth very clearly over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20, saying, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Think about it. Are Christians supposed to use their bodies to indulge in their passions? Are Christians supposed to use their bodies to grab attention for themselves? Are Christians supposed to use their bodies to express their opinions? Are, are, are Christians supposed to use their bodies to do evil or harm to others? Of course not, right? Christians are to use their bodies to honor and serve God. Just look at what Paul has to say over in Romans chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13. Therefore, Paul writes, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer your parts and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. God clearly tells us in these passages that Christians are not to use their bodies as instruments of, well, sin, right? Or instruments of evil or unrighteousness. Instead, Christians are meant to use their bodies as instruments or tools, if you would, for the good of God and for his righteousness. But like we've talked about before, the church at Corinth was a rather spiritually immature church. And when we factor in that, plus the fact that they were a rather carnal community as far as their you know, worldliness is concerned, right? The Christians at Corinth had an especially difficult time understanding that our bodies belong to God and should be all about God. And so when it came time to their bodies, the Corinthians insisted that everything is permissible for me. That was the slogan they adopted over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. In other words, they believed that I have the right to do anything I want with my body. So there. And one of the reasons that they thought that way was because they thought that the physical body was separate from the spiritual body. And that meant that they believed that you could have as much fun as you want with your body just so long as you honored God with your spirit. That way, you know, they could really have it all, right? They could have the best of both worlds. They could have a wild Friday and Saturday night and have a worshipful Sunday. But God has a different and holy way of thinking than simply compartmentalizing our lives. God looks, us, looks at us as a, as a whole being, you see. And so Paul reminds the Christians at Corinth that God has interwoven the body and the spirit and elevated them to equal status, just like 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 13 through 17 tell us. Paul writes there, food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said that two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. In other words, 
When we become a Christian, we become a part of Christ's body, right? And the Holy Spirit lives within us individually and therefore collectively. And that means that what we do with our bodies cannot be separated from Christ and the Holy Spirit. Wherever we go, Christ goes. And whatever we do, we involve Christ. And that means that as Christians, we should understand that our bodies are toys, but God's tools, right? That's because the Christian's body, again, belongs to God. I remember hearing about a sign that, that a professional mechanic had stuck on his toolbox. And it said, don't ask to borrow my tools. I use them to feed my family. And I think that we can all appreciate his need to protect his family and therefore the need to protect his tools. And that's because in order to do his work, the mechanic needed his tools to be available and functional in good working order. Well, the same can be said about God's work and God's tools. There's more important work in the world. There's no more important work in the world that is than God's. And therefore, the tools of God, that's you and me, his people, right, as Christians, need to be available and functional. We need to be in good working order. Think about it. Our lives and our bodies, again, are not our own. And that means that they need to be maintained and useful to God so we can look at the teachings in his Bible and see what he wants us to do and be able to do it so that we can glorify God. Now, I'll be the first to admit that <laughs> I'm not always the best at taking care of my body. I can stand to lose a good 20 or more pounds, you know. But during my week of preparing for this sermon, it helped me to realize that because our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we shouldn't abuse them or neglect them. In doing just a brief survey of God's Word, we see all kinds of warnings about overindulgence and addiction to, to things that, that might harm our body and hinder our service to God. For example, there in our main text today, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul shares with us, again, the philosophy of many of the Corinthians there in verse 12 again, right? Where he wrote, everything is permissible for me. In other words, they were saying, I can do whatever I want. But, you know, uh, I, no, you, you actually can't. Sorry, right? Still, worldly people and worldly Christians might think that they can do whatever they want. But Paul makes sure to correct them in that same verse, saying that not everything is beneficial. Nor should we be mastered or controlled by anything. Okay. And that's why God forbids things like gluttony and drunkenness, because both of those things can destroy our bodies and hinder our service to God. For example, over Proverbs 23 and verses 20 and 21, we're told to not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor and drowsiness clothes than in rags. You know, that's it's something that we don't talk about too much, but gluttony is a sin. And to be fair, gluttony isn't talked about a whole lot in the Bible. And we know that because if we were to use a concordance, we would see that the words glutton, gluttony, and gluttons actually only appear a total of six times in the whole Bible. They appear twice in the Gospels when Jesus is accused of being a drunkard and a glutton in Matthew 11, 19 and Luke 7, 34. And again, we, we find the word in Titus 1, 12 when the general understanding of cretins is that they are liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. The other three times that the word for glutton appears are in the Proverbs, like the verse we read in Proverbs 23. Now, as someone who has struggled from time to time with overeating, this is a sobering topic for me. 
But the truth is, again, our bodies do belong to God, and being gluttonous is a sign of disharmony with God's provision and creation. And that means that what we're really dealing with is a spiritual issue here. And just to clarify, I know that you know that I know that, you know, <laughs> a person's size and shape is affected by more than just what we eat and how much we eat. We also know that genetics and metabolism and certain health conditions do play a factor in a person's size, right? And so some people, <laughs> You know, they manage to get lucky, right? And they can eat whatever they want. And the rest of us, well, we have to be careful the way we look at food because we'll gain weight. Either way, gluttony is the sin here, okay? Not body, shape, or size. Understanding that they're not always connected to gluttony. Still, the fact is, we eat too much. And not just in our country. You ready for this? As a matter of fact, I looked this up. The United States is the 12th most obese country in the world. You say 12th? I thought we were number one. No, there are 11 others ahead of us. Okay, this is a global issue. And when we look back at the history of our nation in particular, and the world really in general, earlier generations paid more attention to the sin of gluttony because it affected them not only physically, but spiritually. They understood that overindulgence in food didn't just lead to a thickened waistline and clogged arteries, but that it was also a symptom of a spiritual problem. Think about it, gluttony isn't wrong just because it might make us physically unhealthy. It's wrong because it's the fruit of self-indulgence. It's wrong because it puts food in place of God. And that means that gluttony can be a form of idolatry and even be a form of addiction, meaning that instead of God controlling us, food is controlling us. Over in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19, when Paul was talking about people who live as enemies of the cross of Christ, he concluded that their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Think about it, when it comes to our body, it's not just overindulgence in food that's an issue, but it can be things like exercise too. The Greeks were well-known athletes in prized, well-honed physiques, right? To the point again of idolatry. And sometimes people today, well, man, they spend every waking hour at the gym, right? But that's not good either. Later on, when Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 8, he cautioned him about putting too much emphasis on physical exercise over spiritual exercise, saying, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. That's not to say we shouldn't exercise, but we shouldn't skip out on Bible study or worship to go work out, okay? And you think, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, again, we need to simply avoid the extremes when it comes to both overindulgence and underindulgence and things like food and, and exercise. And that's because we need to do our best to maintain God's tool the instrument of righteousness that we're supposed to be, our body. And so we need to feed it well and, and keep it moving, you know, and give it the rest it needs. That way we can be the kind of servant that God needs us to be, one who is rested enough to serve and fueled enough to, to, to serve and mobile enough to, to work and, 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 and alert enough to think. Now, when it comes to overindulgence or over-dependence on things like intoxicating spirits, you know, alcohol, God clearly wants us to be filled with His Holy Spirit 
and not the spirits of fermentation. We're not to pollute our spirit that way because the Christian's spirit belongs to God. Now, in contrast to gluttony, the words translated drunk, drunkard, drunken, and drunkenness appear more than 60 times in the Bible. That's 10 times more than gluttony. And whenever we read about drunkenness, it's, it's about warnings and condemnation for those who would allow alcohol to control and destroy their lives. Spiritually speaking, we find that the list of those who won't be going to heaven include those who are drunkards in places like 1 Corinthians 6.10 and Galatians 5.21. And again, this has all got to do with which spirit you are allowing to control your life. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to control you or the alcoholic spirits to control you? Here's what God has to say about that over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Scripture says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. But instead be filled with the Spirit. More bluntly, Proverbs 20 and verse 1 tells us that wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler. Whoever goes astray because of them is not wise. Now, besides the documented negative effects of, of, of excess alcohol on our bodies, there's also the issue of surrendering our minds, right? When we're under the influence of alcohol. Think about it. Have you ever heard someone who has had a little bit too much say uh, something like, that's just the beard talking, you know? You know, because they don't know what they're saying, right? Or what they're doing. But the problem, you know, is... is how, if, how alcohol is, has, has clouded the mind so you don't know what you're saying, you don't know what you're doing, right? And, and they would do and say all kinds of things that they would never say or do if they weren't drunk. No Christian should ever allow alcohol or any intoxicating substance to take control of their mind or their body. Now, just to clarify, Nowhere do we read in God's word, thou shalt not have a drink of alcohol. It's not there. Okay? But it does say that we're not to get drunk. And for some people, that only takes one drink, okay? It only takes one drink to become an alcoholic. So no one's putting, you know, trying to, to say that you can't drink, and no one's trying to say that you should drink, okay? But biblically speaking again, we see that Christians have a freedom here to drink as long as their drinking doesn't have a negative effect on themselves or others. Now, I'm saying that because that's what I see in the scriptures, okay? We do see clearly that there needs to be a balance. Same thing with eating. Same thing with exercise. Same thing with everything. But like many Christians I know, including myself personally, I choose not to drink alcohol at all. That way it doesn't cause a problem for me or anyone else, and I have complete control over my thoughts and my body. And I believe that is pleasing to God. Maybe the best thing to ask yourself before you overindulge in anything is, is what I'm doing honoring God with my body. We can think about that, whether or not we're at Golden Corral going back for an extra helping, or if we're sitting down with some buddies chugging back another beer, okay? Remember, our bodies don't belong to us. They belong to God. Glorify God with your body. Honor God with your body. Is drinking glorifying God? Is overeating glorifying God? Is exercising all day and not focusing at all on God, glorifying God? Something to think about, right? Now, there's one more area that we want to look at today where this concept of our bodies not belonging to us really runs the most countercultural. You know, never mind food, alcohol, or, or exercise. That's the realm of sexuality. Biblically speaking, 
Again, the Christian's sexuality belongs to God. Again, let's go back to our main text in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul had to counter the Corinthians' misunderstandings about their ungodly use of their bodies with regard to sexual relations. Again, back in our main text, starting in verse 13, Paul writes, Food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Moving on down to verse 18, he continues, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits out, are outside his, his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now that's what God says. But what people say today is, well, it's my body and I'll do what I want. Same thing with food or alcohol or whatever, right? Same thing with sexuality. Now, like before, there are some general disclaimers that we need to make. Just like God gave us food to eat, we're not to be a glutton, right? And just like sexuality, God has made us sexual beings. So sexual relations is not a bad thing. But we're not to be promiscuous. We're not to be perverted, right? Think about it. God is the one who created everything, and he made man and woman, and therefore marriage. And so our sexuality is God's idea, and therefore, from his perspective, it is special and holy. And that means that sexual intimacy is meant to be seen as a holy gift that is meant to be opened in a special place and at special times. And that special place is marriage. And that special time is with your spouse. Sadly, the Christians at Corinth, again, had some rather flippant views of sexuality. And they had a difficult time adjusting to God's design for sexuality. And unfortunately, there are many today who have views on sexuality that would probably make the Corinthians blush. But there's no reason for a soul in a godly union to blush or to feel any shame. We see this back with the very first couple ever created in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25, where we read that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And the reason why there was no shame or regrets or blame or guilt or confusion or any negative emotions in their sexual intimacy was because they were fulfilling God's plan for men and women in marriage. Their union was beautiful, meaningful, and fulfilling. Again, our bodies belong to God, and that means that we are meant to use them according to God's will. And again, not just sexually, but in everything, with our minds and our speech and our eyes and our ears and our hands and our feet. We were bought with a price precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're not our own. We need to honor God with our bodies. May God give us all the desire and ability to make our bodies all about God. If you have a desire to do that, it starts by choosing to follow Jesus, by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then confessing him as your Lord, you make the commitment to enter into his covenant promise by being immersed in the watery grave for the forgiveness of your sins. And then rising up out of the water, you're born again to live your life for him until Jesus comes back again or you go to be with him. For those of us who are already Christians, may we always do our best to live in such a way that shows that our body is all about God. And so we watch what we eat, we watch what we drink. And yeah, maybe we watch how we exercise. And maybe if you're doing too much, you cut back. And if you're not doing anything, maybe it's time to start, right? That way, again, we'll be able to give glory to God.
and help others see the way to God more clearly. Let's pray. Most Holy Father, dear God, as we think about our bodies today, help us to understand that our bodies really need to be all about you. And Father, whether we're Christian or not, if we're struggling with that idea, Father, help us to see the need to glorify you in all that we do. And if we're following you, Father, help us to follow you better. And if there's someone who needs to start on that path, that journey, heaven bound with you, we pray that you will touch them today so that they will see that it really is all about you. It is all about God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Again, we want to thank you for making us a part of your Lord's Day and pray that you'll have the opportunity to worship with us here at Orangevale, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And of course, we understand that's not possible for everyone. You might live far away or maybe you're homebound. Either way, we do hope that you'll make the, the regular habit of, of logging in and, and assembling with us online Sunday mornings at 11 on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you and God bless.